Hello, welcome to chapter 27, electrolytes. After we've looked at the urinary system, now we are going to look at how our body regulates all of these different electrolytes, these positive and negative ions that are in our body. But part of what our kidneys are gonna regulate is that fluid level in your body. Body fluids are any substance or liquid that can, it has some sort of water in it and it's going to dissolve solutes. We have water or bodily fluids in two main areas. We're gonna have intracellular fluid. So that's the inside of our cells. That's most of it, most of the fluids. We have that extracellular fluid. That is anything outside of cells. So it's all bodily fluids. That's about one third. Interstitial fluid is just the fluid that fills between this, the space between cells. That's most of our extracellular fluid is gonna be interstitial fluid that is just found in areas around our cells. Blood plasma is also part of that extracellular fluid. Not as much as the interstitial fluid, but it's a significant amount. So it's just that liquid portion. We have different mechanisms or ways in our body that we separate all of these different fluids. We have that plasma membrane of our cells. This is gonna keep those fluids inside of that cell, that cytosol or inner intracellular fluid, separate from that interstitial fluid. Our blood vessels, our blood vessels have some until we get down to those capillaries. So we have these pretty thick walls that holds fluid inside our blood vessels. So a lot of our body's mass is made of fluids, males more than females. But still we have more fluids in our system than we do solids. So we must maintain a balance when all, with all of these fluids. This fluid balance is making sure we have enough water, the correct amount of solutes inside of those. And it's found in the correct proportions around the entire body. Water makes up majority of the bodily fluids that keeps this fluid balance in our system. Water is can be up to 75% of your body's mass. That's in babies, infants. It goes down to that 45. It just depends on the mass of your body, your age. Age plays a big role, so does gender. How much adipose tissue you have. Here's the interesting thing. People who are obese have less water than leaner people. Because water is less than 20% of the mass of adipose cells because fat and water don't mix. So higher adipose cell count, the lower water content you have. Your skeletal muscle is 65% water. As I mentioned, infants, there's about 75% of their total body mass is going to be water, and that doesn't actually go down until about two years in age. Up until puberty, water accounts for 60% of body mass in both males and females. Lean males can have up to 60% of body water, while lean females are, have about 55%. 
just because females tend to have more subcutaneous fat than males do. So we maintain our fluid levels through filtration, reabsorption, diffusion, and osmosis. Because diffusion is the movement of particles, osmosis is the movement of water. Even though different particles and fluid are moving into and out of different areas, the amount of fluid present does not seem to change. Osmosis is again how water is going to move <clears throat> inside and out of these different cells. Most of the solutes that we have in our system, and these fluids are gonna be electrolytes. These are compounds that when they come in contact with water, they dissociate into ions like sodium chloride. When sodium chloride comes in contact with water, it dissociates, that's table salt, into sodium and water. And this is how we get those electrolytes. When we intake water and different electrolytes, we're never taking in the same amount of water to match the needs for like the say the amount of sodium that we take in. So our kidneys are doing a lot of work getting rid of water or getting rid of too many electrolytes. They're trying to maintain this homeostasis or that balance of fluids and electrolytes in our system. We get water mostly through ingestion, drinking water, taking it in. But we can get water through metabolic synthesis. We do make water molecules is byproducts in certain chemical reactions. Water or these liquids are used for a lot of different purposes. Metabolic water, as I said, is usually because we did a dehydration synthesis. We took a water molecule out when we reorganized different ions. We lose water through our kidneys. We have that insensible perspiration where we lose water, where water's being evaporated up off of our skin that we don't even know about, our lungs. Every time we breathe in air, we add moisture to it to humidify it. So every time we breathe out, we try to reabsorb most of the water, but we don't always reabsorb all of it. In your digestive canal, we add all that water is to help kind of soften, liquefy the different contents as it's traveling through that digestive system. We absorb most of it, but we don't absorb all of it. And then women in the reproductive age, they lose more water during that menstrual cycle. So this kind of shows we get most of our water from drinking it. We get some through foods. We get the smallest amount technically through dehydration reactions. Kidneys get rid of, the mo get rid of most of it. Your skin is going to get rid of quite a bit your lungs and your GI tract are also gonna lose some of that water just during the breathing process or during excretion. So these different bodily water properties here. So this water that is being formed through aerobic respiration It's going to actually tell us how much ATP we are producing in our cells. So 
So when we produce more ATP, we produce more water. Water can be, we can gain more water by how much we take in. We all require so much water every day. Some people take in more, some people take in less than what their body really needs. This is where we have an area in the hypothalamus that helps to try to stimulate you to start drinking. It, this hypothalamus thirst center sends signals to try to get you to take a drink of water, take a drink of something. Dehydration is where we've lost more water than we've gained. So we filtered out too much water, but we haven't replaced that amount of water through aerobic respiration, through those dehydration synthesis, or through drinking it. So we have a decrease in the volume of water and we have an increase in the osmolarity of those bodily fluids. We end up with, if we're dehydrated, we have decreased blood volume. This decreased blood volume causes our blood pressure to fall. Those osmoreceptors, they are actually trying to stimulate, send signals saying, hey, drink something, get us some water. There's other signals that are gonna come from this thirst center because we have receptors in the atria and that's gonna detect blood volume. These receptors are gonna determine if there's not enough blood volume coming into the atria during that filling period. It's gonna send signals to the brain saying, hey, drink something. We have these baroreceptors that are detecting that blood pressure. That angiotensin II and that angiotensin or renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway stimulates the kidneys to take up more fluids. Your mouth starts to get dry when you are dehydrated. And as again, that's going to stimulate or send signals to drink something. We do lose water and solutes when we sweat. Even when we breathe or exhale during exercise, we are going to lose water and solutes. It's just what happens. We eliminate excess body water through urine. So, Urinary salt loss or NaCl, that's sodium chloride. This is what determines body fluid volume. Or as if we're taking, if we're getting rid of a lot of sodium into our urine, water follows solutes in osmosis. So sodium chloride gets filtered out, water goes with it. Sodium chloride gets pulled back in to the bloodstream, water's going to follow it. So what determines your osmolarity of those different bodily fluids is going to be that urinary water loss specifically. We do have different hormones that do play a role in your water loss. Antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin is another name for it that comes from that hypothalamus. It's stored in that posterior hypothalamus. It comes from the, or it's made and goes down to that posterior pituitary. It's stored in that to be released. And part of what that does is it's going to stimulate thirst. It's also gonna increase 
the release of that antidiuretic hormone. What it also does is it's going to promote water channel proteins being put into the membrane of cells. These are into the kidneys, these tubules in the kidneys, which causes water to be reabsorbed. And it gets reabsorbed through osmosis. As water gets reabsorbed, it's going to increase the blood volume. And when we increase the blood volume, we increase the blood pressure. So once we have enough water in our system, that antidiuretic hormone is not secreted out as much. So it gets, its levels start to decrease in the blood. And as that antidiuretic hormone starts to decrease, some of those aquaporin channels get pulled back inside of those cells that line those different tubules until the next time we need them. So there's a lot of different things that are going to stimulate the increase in water, either reuptake or for you to drink it. That increased blood osmolarity, the decreased blood volume, decreased blood pressure, even a dry mouth, as these are all going to stimulate the thirst center, which is going to hopefully increase water intake. So there's more than just blood osmolarity that is going to determine whether this antidiuretic hormone gets secreted, as we just looked at on the last slide decreases in blood volume or blood pressure. Those atrial volume receptors. We have that antidiuretic hormone that gets stimulated in pain, nausea, and stress. This antidiuretic hormone, it gets inhibited by alcohol. It promotes filtration and of water in the kidneys and diuresis, getting rid of all those extra fluids. We have other hormones that regulate the loss of sodium and chloride. Aldosterone. If we have a decrease in blood pressure, decrease in blood volume, deficiency of sodium in the plasma, the kidneys release that renin that renin activates that renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway, which is gonna stimulate that absorption of sodium and water follows sodium. The heart, atrial natriuretic peptide. It gets secreted if we have an increase in blood volume. If that atria is stretching because we have so much, that blood volume is too, is too much, it promotes the filtration of sodium into the urine and so water follows sodium. So it's gonna help decrease our blood volume. So there's a lot of different things, antidiuretic hormone. It's going to, it responds to decrease in blood volume, decrease in blood pressure, pain, nausea, stress. This antidiuretic hormone gets secreted out to prevent water loss. Aldosterone, if we have a decrease in blood pressure or if we don't have enough sodium in our plasma. Kidneys release renin, which triggers that renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway, which causes aldosterone, which causes an increased sodium reabsorption. Water's gonna follow. Atrial natriuretic peptide, if we have too much blood volume, and if there's a stretch on those atria because there is too much blood volume, it releases that atrial natriuretic peptide to get rid of or excrete sodium, and then water follows. And that'll these will cause either an increase or a decrease in that blood volume. Here are this nice chart from your textbook that shows the different areas, the different hormones that 
control your bodily fluids, as well as that thirst center to try to get you to drink water. An enema. An enema is putting some sort of solution into the rectum. This putting these different solutions into the rectum. So when some solution is put in through the rectum, it can actually help to draw water. And when water and solutes are going to follow each other into that colon, it helps to evacuate feces faster. These are different ways that we can treat constipation. The problem is, is doing repeat enemas can actually cause too much fluid loss and eventually lead to fluid and electrolyte imbalances. So what happens in water intoxication? Too much water. If we lose, if we have too much water in our system, it could lead be because of a too certain situations if we don't have enough water in our body it can lead to different situations so if we have lost too much blood if we're sweating we're vomiting diarrhea with intake of plain water so water from your tap per se there's not enough sodium in there so we're decreasing that amount of sodium that we have in that extracellular fluid. Decreased sodium means we have decreased osmolarity. So that osmosis of water from that extracellular fluid goes into that intracellular fluid. And this is what causes water detoxification or, water, or these different cells to swell. When that happens, people get confused. It can cause seizures can cause a coma. It can even cause death. Too much water in your system with not enough electrolytes to balance it. If it comes in too fast, your body can't handle it. So ions get formed because these different particles or electrolytes, when they get into bodily fluids, they're going to dissolve and break apart. The easiest example is sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is going to dissociate to sodium and to chloride. These are what we know as electrolytes. These electrolytes, they get kind of confined into certain fluid compartments. So when these electrolytes kind of get confined to these different areas, they're going to control the water and the fluid movement in those specific areas. These ions are going to maintain that acid-base balance. They're going to carry, because they're positive or negatively charged, they carry that electrical current. And if we have several ions together, they can actually serve as a cofactor. So say on an enzyme, for an enzyme to be able to do its job, one of these ions also has to bind to this enzyme along with whatever reaction this enzyme does for this reaction to actually happen. This is what it means when they're a cofactor. We're going to break apart glycogen, say this is not what happens. This is just an example. We need some other particle in there. We may need ATP to break apart glycogen. That works as a cofactor. So all of these different electrolytes, sodium, 
we find more sodium in that interstitial fluid outside of the cells than blood plasma. There's very little sodium inside of our cells. Unlike potassium, there's a lot of potassium inside of cells. There's a lot more magnesium inside of cells, chloride. Calcium, they're all pretty similar. There's not as much calcium in the blood plasma as there is in the, or there's more calcium, sorry, in the blood plasma than there is in that intracellular fluid. Proteins, bicarbonate, all of these different compounds or ions are found in large quantities in certain areas. This is how they get confined to those specific spaces. So let's look at some of these. Sodium. Sodium, we find a lot of in that extracellular fluid. It's majority of the extracellular cat ions, those positive ions. Those sodium ions, they help to maintain that electrolyte balance because they're helping with the osmolarity of those fluids. They cause, or they're part of the process of action potentials in neurons and muscle fibers in North America. We tend to take in more sodium than what our body needs. So our kidneys excrete out all that extra sodium, but it's also going to conserve some of it for in case there's times of shortage. We have sodium readily available. We control those sodium levels in our blood through aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone, and atrial natriuretic peptide. Aldosterone causes reabsorption of sodium. When that plasma level drops too low, known as hyponatremia, hypo to below, natremia is for sodium. Antidiuretic hormone, that is going to cause more excretion of water to try to restore those normal sodium levels through excretion of sodium as well. Atrial natriuretic peptide increases that sodium excretion. That is because sodium levels are too high or hypernatremia. So, a sodium imbalance. What indicates an actual sodium imbalance? It's usually because we have too much sodium. And a lot of times it's because the kidneys are failing to get rid of that sodium. If they don't get rid of that sodium, we have an increase in blood volume, increase in blood pressure, and we end up with edema because we just have too much fluids. Hyperaldosteronism and renal failure. These are what can cause sodium retention. If we lose too much sodium, it causes too much fluid loss. This is hypovolemia, blood volume, below normal blood volume. And it's actually because of sodium loss. It's also because of that aldosterone secretion. And there's different medications or drugs that can try to help with some of this stuff that work with diuretics. It, this is one way that we're trying to maintain all these different levels. Chloride. Chloride is an anion. So that's a negative anion in that extracellular fluid. Chloride 
can move back and forth between the intracellular and extracellular areas. Just because there are chloride leak channels and antiporters that moves chloride around. Chloride works to balance anions in different places. This is that chloride shift that we talked about before. This chloride shift is because those red blood cells in that blood plasma, and because of that, carbon dioxide is going to increase or decrease. We have the antiporter exchange for chloride and HCO3 minus. And this is what maintains those anion levels between the intra and extracellular fluids. Chloride is part of that hydrochloric acid in your stomach. Antidiuretic hormone is going to regulate that chloride balance. Because it controls the amount of fluids that we lose. So anything that increases or decreases those kidneys from reabsorbing sodium ions are also going to affect that absorption or excretion of chloride ions. Potassium. Potassium is that most abundant cation, again, for positive ions, in that intracellular fluid. Potassium is what maintains that resting membrane potential. It also helps during that repolarization phase of those action potentials. It maintains that intracellular fluid volume. So when, when potassium moves in and out of cells, it gets exchanged for hydrogen. So it regulates the pH as hydrogen maintains the different bodily pHs. So that blood plasma of potassium is regulated by aldosterone. So when blood plasma concentration is high, aldosterone gets secreted, which stimulates those kidneys to secrete more potassium into the urine. When that potassium level is too low, aldosterone secretion goes down. When that aldosterone secretion goes down, potassium gets reabsorbed. Since potassium is needed for that repolarization, if we don't have enough potassium, it can actually be lethal and cause that ventricular fibrillation. Bicarbonate, another anion. It is most prevalent in that extracellular fluid. So, this bicarbonate, it's actually going to increase as the blood flows through the capillaries. Why? Carbon dioxide gets released from our cells. It mixes with water to form that carbonic acid, which will then dissociate into hydrogen and bicarbonate. So as blood goes through those pulmonary capillaries in the lungs, that bicarbonate is going to decrease as that carbon dioxide goes into the lungs to be exhaled out. This intracellular fluid, we contain, we have bicarbonate in that intracellular fluid, just a small amount though. So we exchange chloride for bicarbonate and that helps to maintain that balance between neg positive and negative or the charges inside and out of that cell. The kidneys are going to regulate that bicarb the blood bicarbonate levels. We have cells in the kidney that can form bicarbonate and we can release it into the blood or we can excrete out that excess bicarbonate. 
calcium. Calcium, it's stored in the bones. It's the most abundant mineral in the body. 98% of that calcium is found in those skeleton and those teeth. Calcium is mostly an extracellular anion or cation. We need calcium for blood clotting, neurotransmitter release, muscle tone, excitability of nerves and muscle tissues. Parathyroid hormone is the most important hormone or regulator of calcium in our blood. Low levels of calcium stimulates the release of parathyroid hormone, which causes those osteoclasts in the bone to break up the bone and take in or release more calcium out into the blood. Parathyroid hormone increases bone reabsorption, resorption and reabsorption of calcium. So it causes that calcium to be reabsorbed out of the kidneys back into the blood. Calcium increases the calcitrol or vitamin D. We need this calcitrol, the active form of vitamin D to be able to absorb calcium out of our digestive system. Kind of works as a co-porter. We need that calcium there to bring, or that vitamin D, that calcitrol there to bring that calcium out. Phosphate. Most of our phosphate is found in calcium phosphate, which is found in our bones and our teeth. We have three different types of phosphate ions. These are these three different types. And they are intracellular ions. So when the, we have a normal pH, phosphate, this HPO4 2 minus is the most common type of phosphate. It's a buffer to hydrogen. Most Phosphate ions are covalently bonded. They're usually bonded to lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and adenosine triphosphate. The same hormones that are going to regulate calcium regulate phosphate. So that parathyroid hormone and calcitrol or calcitrol from the thyroid gland. Parathyroid hormone stimulates the reabsorption of bone so that calcium and phosphate gets released out into the blood. It causes the kidneys to reabsorb. Calcitrol promotes the absorption and of phosphate and calcium in that digestive system. Now magnesium. We have quite a bit of magnesium in our bone matrix. We have magnesium ions in that intracellular fluid and that extracellular fluid. It is the second most common intracellular cat ion. It is a cofactor for a lot of these different enzymes. It helps us break down carbohydrates, proteins, and we need magnesium as a cofactor for those sodium potassium pumps. So we use magnesium for a lot. We need it for neuromuscular activity, synaptic transmission, myocardial function, so your heart working. Parathyroid hormone requires magnesium. There's a lot of different ways that we regulate the levels of magnesium, and it's by varying how much is excreted. So we increase excretion of magnesium to hypercalcemia, high calcium, hypermagnesium, 
magnesium, yeah. Too much magnesium. If we have an increase in, in extracellular fluid volume, a decrease in parathyroid hormone or acidosis. So these are the main hormones, or not hormones, electrolytes in our system. What these different electrolytes are going to cause if we have a deficiency and if we have them in excess, like too much sodium can increase your thirst. Decreased sodium can cause muscle weakness or dizziness and headache. It can cause hypotension, so decreased blood pressure. Decreased chloride can cause muscle spasms. Too much can cause lethargy and weakness. Potassium, not enough, can cause muscle fatigue, can cause paralysis of your muscles, mental confusion. Too much potassium can cause irritability, nausea, and vomiting, and diarrhea. Calcium can cause numbness and tingling in your toes if you don't have enough. It can cause vomiting, polyuria, itching, bone pain. If you have it in too much. Phosphate can cause confusion and seizures. It can cause anorexia, nausea, and vomiting. Magnesium can cause weakness, irritability, anorexia, nausea, but too much, it can cause hypotension, decreased blood pressure. So this acid-base balance, as we've mentioned several times, hydrogen ions, are what determine the pH of our bodily fluids. We need to maintain this pH, this acid-base balance, for our cells to function appropriately or the correct way. Because it's gonna maintain that 3D shape of our proteins. If it gets too acidic, it starts to break that down. A lot of our cells are very sensitive to pH changes. So if we have a diet that is very large in proteins, the metabolism that is used can, to break those down can actually cause the blood to become more acidic. So we have different ways to maintain our system, our arterial blood pH. So we have different metabolic reactions to produce excess hydrogen ions. We don't have a lot of mechanisms for disposal and it can cause hydrogen ions to get high very quickly. So, we use some of these different systems. We have this buffer system. This buffer system works because it's going to bind hydrogen. So it's gonna remove these hydrogen ions to these buffers that'll raise the pH level back to a more neutral pH. Just breathing out carbon dioxide can raise that blood pH. So the depth and the rate of the breathing can be altered just to get rid of more carbon dioxide. Kidneys can actually excrete out hydrogen. This is the slowest way to regulate your blood pH, but it's how we can get rid of carbonic acid. It's ways we can get rid of other acids is through excretion. So our buffer systems. These different buffer systems, they usually have a weak acid and some sort of weak base. These weak acids and these weak bases can kind of work to maintain the blood pH. So if there's a quick change in that pH because of something, this buffer system is going to come in. 
We have a protein buffer system. We have a carbonate carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, and then a phosphate buffer system. So this protein buffer system, it's the most abundant one we have because it deals with the hemoglobin, the albumin. So as we've talked about, proteins are made of chains of amino acids. They're going to have a carboxyl group, and they're going to have an amino group, usually. These amino acids do. So these different functional groups, parts of these amino acids, can actually work as that protein buffer system. That carboxyl group is at one end, and it kind of acts like an acid because it releases, it can release out hydrogen causing, or when that pH gets too high, the hydrogen is able to react with too much hydroxide ions. And this is what makes water. That amino group on the other end can act as a base. So it can combine with that hydrogen when the pH gets too low. So that's the nice thing with proteins is they can actually buffer both sides, acids and bases. So water plus carbon dioxide gives us that carbonic acid. That carbonic acid can split apart into those hydrogen ions into that bicarbonate. From here, we have oxyhemoglobin plus a hydrogen ion will actually give us reduced hemoglobin and then a, that oxygen molecule that can be reduced or released out into the tissues to be used in cellular respiration. That, by, that carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. We need to have bicarbonate ions and we need to have that carbonic acid, which is that base and that acid, weak. So if we have too much hydrogen ions, that bicarbonate will come in. It removes those hydrogen ions by making carbonic acid. Carbonic acid can dissociate into that water and that carbon dioxide on that slide above, which allows us to breathe out that carbon dioxide and change our blood pH. If there's not enough hydrogen ions, Carbonic acid can break off some hydrogen ions. We get hydrogen and bicarbonate from bicar from bicarbonate or from carbonic acid, sorry, to release out some of those hydrogen ions to lower the pH. Now our phosphate system. This phosphate buffer system. It's pretty similar to that carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, but instead we have dehydro dehydrogen phosphate or dihydrogen phosphate and monohydrogen phosphate. Since phosphates are those anions, that dihydrogen phosphate can act as a weak acid. It can buffer hydroxide ions. It can work to break apart and give us water and monohydrogen phosphate. Monohydrogen phosphate can work as a base because we can add that hydrogen to that monohydrogen phosphate and get dihydrogen phosphate. We have more phosphate in the intracellular. So that phosphate buffer system regulates the pH inside of cells more than outside of cells. So when we breathe out that carbon dioxide, it works to maintain our pH because we have too much carbon dioxide in these fluids, it's going to increase hydrogen. Too much hydrogen decreases pH. 
So this carbonic acid can be exhaled by releasing carb carbon dioxide off of it. And this is known as a volatile acid. So as we decrease the concentration of carbon dioxide, it causes the pH to go up. So that carbon dioxide plus water can give us that carbonic acid, which can be turned into bicarbonate plus hydrogen. So these can go both directions. These can all work either way. So changing the depth of your breath, we're increasing, if we're breathing more carbon dioxide out, this decrease, this decreasing levels of carbon dioxide is actually causing that pH to decrease. When carbon dioxide levels go too high, we have this reaction that causes the blood pH to drop by these hydrogen ions being released. So we kind of work to create and maintain our pH just by breathing. So, if we get rid of, we exhale this carbon dioxide, these different bodily fluids and the rate and depth of breathing work as a negative feedback loop. Again, that homeostasis. So when the blood gets too acidic, we decrease the, we, our brain detects this decrease in pH through those chemoreceptors, the aorta, the carotid bodies, and it's gonna cause the diaphragm and our respiratory muscles to contract more forcefully so, and frequently so, more carbon dioxide is breathed out. Less carbonic acid is gonna form and fewer hydrogen ions are now present. Blood pH is gonna now increase. And when it goes back to its normal, when it get, the blood pH goes back to its normal concentration, our pH is now kind of leveled out. This negative feedback loop will operate if that blood level of carbon dioxide increases. So we increase our breathing. We're removing more carbon dioxide. By that, we're reducing hydrogen concentration which increases the blood pH. We decrease carbon dioxide carb concentration. So when breathing starts to decrease, carbon dioxide is gonna to start to accumulate in the blood again. So hydrogen is gonna increase in the blood and it's going to decrease that pH again. So our kidneys can work to excrete some of that hydrogen out. These non these different metabolic reactions can produce this non-volatile acid, like sulfuric acid. And this is the only way we can actually unload or excrete hydrogen into the urine. The proximal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts will secrete hydrogen into these tubular fluids that are being created and they excrete excess hydrogen when that pH is too low and it'll excrete bicarbonate when the pH is too high because bicarbonate is one of those neutralizers that turns things more basic. So our blood pH likes to sit between 7.35 and 7.45 considered acidosis if we are below that 7.35 and alkalosis if we are above that 7.35. Acidosis can cause depression of that central nervous system. Means those action potentials are not set out as well. 
is that that pH goes below seven, that nervous system is depressed so much that that person gets confused. They can actually become comatose. They could die. Alkalosis can cause overexcitability of the nervous system. So these neurons that are going to conduct these impulses, they may actually send out impulses when they're not even stimulated, just because everything going on. This is what can cause nervousness. Muscle spasms, convulsions, and it can also lead to death, which is why our body has so many different ways to neutralize our blood because we're trying to stay within this very small range. So it could be a very small change. Some very small change can actually lead to that acidosis or alkalosis. And our body has way to, ways to counter it through compensation. So this compensation can be complete when this pH is brought back to normal or within a normal range. It's partial if it's still lower than 7.35 or 7.45. So if we have an altered metabolic pH due to some sort of metabolic reasons, it can cause hyperventilation or hypoventilation because we're trying to bring that blood pH back to normal. That's that respiratory compensation. Our kidneys are the other way. They can change the secretion and absorption of hydrogen and bicarbonate in the kidneys to level back out that pH. So here's all these different mechanisms to maintain the pH in our bodily fluids. It is extremely important to maintain these different fluids. So we have many different ways to go about it. Respiratory acidosis is when we have high pressures of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood. So we're not breathing out enough carbon dioxide, which is going to cause that pH to drop. So anything that causes a decrease in that carbon dioxide movement out to breathe it out could cause this respiratory acidosis, like emphysema, pulmonary edema, even respiratory injuries to the respiratory center of the medulla, airway obstructions, even disorders to the muscles that are involved with breathing can cause respiratory acidosis. If the problem is not too severe, the kidneys can make up for it. They try to treat respiratory acidosis to try to get more carbon dioxide exhaled out. Alkalosis. Alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis is when that arterial blood pressure, blood pressure of carbon dioxide is too low. So it causes that pH to fall. When that happens, it causes hyperventilation. And it's because of what something that stimulates that dorsal respiratory group. We have an oxygen deficiency because of high altitude that could cause it. Pulmonary disease, cerebral vascular accident, anxiety, severe anxiety. So the kidneys can compensate to bring that blood back into that normal range be, by the excretion of hydrogen and the reabsorption of bicarbonate, but we work to try to increase the levels of carbon dioxide in the body. That's where breathing into a bag where you're breathing back in the air you just exhaled out can be helpful to try to restore this respiratory alkalosis faster.
metabolic acidosis is where that arterial blood bicarbonate levels drop too much. And it can cause the pH to decrease. It may be because of an actual loss of bicarbonate. It could be because of diarrhea or renal dysfunction. We've accumulated too many acids like carbonic acid during ketosis. Kidneys may fail to excrete hydrogen. If it's not too severe, hyperventilation can actually compensate. But we try to treat respiratory acidosis through intravenous sodium bicarbonate to try to correct this acidosis. Metabolic alkalosis is when that bicarbonate level is too high in that blood. Maybe taking, or that re non-respiratory loss of acid or excess intake of alkaline drugs could cause that pH to get too high. Excess vomiting. The gastric content specifically. So we're losing that hydrochloric acid gastric suctioning, diuretics, endocrine disorders, alkaline drugs like antacids, severe hydration. We try to use respiratory compensation to bring that, bring that pH back to that normal level. We tend to give fluid solutions to correct that most different electrolyte deficiencies, plus, whatever's causing that alkalosis to happen. So here's these different acidosis and alkalosis. It could be respiratory or metabolic. What causes them and how we can correct them. So the cause of an acid-base imbalance can kind of be kind of pinpointed to three different causes, the pH, the concentration of bicarbonate, and the pressures of carbon dioxide in the blood. So there's three blood chemistry tests that we can look at. We can actually look at the pH to see if it's too high or low. We can determine the pressure of carbon dioxide or bicarbonate. So if the cause is the carbon dioxide, it's respiratory. If it's bicarbonate, it's metabolic. So now we start looking at other values after we've looked at this information. And if everything else is within normal range, there's no compensation. If something is outside of its normal range, there's compensation happening in the body to try to at least partially correct this imbalance. So there's between the aging fluids, electrolytes, and acid and balance base homeostasis, there is between an elderly person and a an premature infant, there is a huge difference. This is why infants tend to have more problems than adults. So that amount of water, because an infant or a newborn their body can be up to 75% water, while an adult is 55 to 60. Because that extracellular fluid actually is subject to more change than what's inside of the cell, because the cell can regulate what lets in and out. Outside of that cell can't regulate it as well as inside of the cell. It still does a good job, but not as well. So if we have rapid losses or gains of body water, this can be critical to infants. We take in more fluid, or infants take in more fluids than adults tend to. So 
Slight changes in the amount of fluids that an infant takes in can actually cause some pretty severe abnormalities. The metabolic rate. An infant's metabolic rate is almost double in adults. So they're producing a lot more metabolic wastes. They're producing a lot more acids. And this can lead to acidosis in infants. The functional development of the kidneys. The kidneys are only about half efficient at creating and concentrating urine than an adult. So the kidneys of newborns, they can either, con they can't concentrate the urine and they can't really get rid of excess acids as efficiently as an adult can. And that's all because their kidneys just don't function as well. Infants have a smaller surface area to the volume as infants or an adult is three times greater than an infant's. So water loss through that skin, that insensible perspiration and could be sensible perspiration for that matter. It tends to be higher in adults because adults have a larger surface area. Those breathing rates. If you've ever held an infant and paid attention to their breathing rate, it is a lot faster than an adult. So they are losing more water and moisture from their lungs. So they can get respiratory alkalosis because they're breathing more, which eliminates more carbon dioxide, which lowers that pressure of carbon dioxide. And then their iron concentration. They have more potassium and more chloride than adults. And this towards to lead towards that metabolic acidosis. Adults though have, tend to have more problems with maintaining their fluid levels, their electrolytes and that acid-base balance. As we get older, age, age affects everything. As we get older, we get decreased volume of intracellular fluid, decreased potassium, and we have decreased skeletal muscle mass, increasing adipose tissue, we get decreases in respiratory and renal function. So this is gonna change that acid-base balance. You can get decreased blood flow into the kidneys, decreased glomular filtration rate, reduced sensitivity to antidiuretic hormone. We could have a decrease in the number and efficiency of sweat glands, water loss from the skin, declines as we get older. So older adults, they are more likely to see dehydration or hypernatremia, too much sodium. And this could be just due to inadequate, inadequate, inadequate fluid intake. They lose too much water but not enough sodium. And it could be because of vomit, feces, or urine. Hyponatremia, because they don't have enough sodium intake. They could have like, an elevated loss of sodium out of the body. Their kidneys aren't functioning. Hypokalemia. This happens in older adults who tend to use laxatives to relieve that constipation or they are, or they take potassium depleting diuretic drugs for hypertension, heart disease. They can have acidosis because they don't have that ability of those lungs and those kidneys to compensate for that imbalance. One cause of acidosis is because we produce anemia by the kidney tubules. And when we have anemia, we can't combine it with hydrogen to be excreted, which can cause a reduced exhalation in carbon dioxide. Thank you for listening to our chapter on electrolyte imbalances in our body. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.